Hello and welcome to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. We will, of course, be keeping across all the developments from the Middle East tonight and reviewing the week with our guests here in the studio. But first, the headlines this hour. Tonight, a moment of hope after seven weeks of war. 24 hostages are released by Hamas under the terms of a Qatari broker deal. They include 13 Israeli women and children, 10 Thai nationals and one Filipino. In exchange, 39 Palestinian prisoners held in Israeli jails have been released in the West Bank. Also tonight, a warning of more violence in Dublin after a night of riots and disorder sparked by stabbings in the city centre. And the former Paralympic champion Oscar Pistorius is to be freed from jail on parole nearly 11 years after murdering his girlfriend, Riva Steen Campbell. Coming up, I will be joined by our news reviewers, the journalist John Elledge and the comedian Gronje Maguire, uh, both of them with us until 9 o'clock, giving us their take on the big stories of the week. Thanks for joining us. It's Friday night. Evening all. In one of the most significant days of the conflict between Israel and Hamas, 24 hostages have been released under the terms of a truce deal. Tonight, they are being reunited with their friends and family after undergoing medical assessment. They were freed on condition of a four-day ceasefire in Gaza, also the release of 39 Palestinian prisoners. Well, as part of the deal, 13 Israeli women and children, 10 Thai nationals and one Filipino citizen began their journey home to their families this afternoon, travelling through the Rafa border crossing as part of the Red Cross convoy. The hostages, who range in age from elderly women to young children, were helped by medics and taken to hospital in Egypt to be checked over before they travelled on back to their families. Meanwhile, outside the Offer prison on the West Bank, Palestinians clashed with Israel Defence Forces, who threw rounds of tear gas at some of those gathered outside, waiting for the release of 39 women and children. And let's speak to our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle, joining us from Tel Aviv this evening. Alistair, good to see you. Um, I suppose there will be plenty of people, Palestinian and Israeli, this evening, very, very pleased to see what is taking place. But, of course, the situation remains incredibly tense, I suspect. Yeah, I think we should remember that on both sides of this divide, in Israel and in Gaza, there is huge relief that this ceasefire has been agreed and, for now, has been adhered to and nobody has broken it. Gazans do see the release of Israeli hostages as a moment, in a way, for celebration for them. I'm talking about Gazan civilians because they have been living under seven weeks of bombardment uh, and they want an end to it. Israel has been waiting for seven long weeks to see some of their people returned home and finally today, a couple of hours ago, that moment happened. The ceasefire had come close on a number of occasions and then, for whatever reason, it didn't happen. We thought it was going to come into play yesterday morning and then it was delayed but this morning at 7 a.m. here the ceasefire did take place and there has not been uh, any exchange of fire between the two sides since and so with people gathered here in Tel Aviv on a plaza that has become a permanent vigil for those who have been missing those who are taken hostage in Gaza the news that finally those 13 Israelis and 10 <laughs> Thai uh, national, sorry, nine Thai nationals and one Nepalese national had crossed the border into Israel was a moment of relief, was a moment of joy. This is the scene tonight here on the square. It has emptied out slightly as we've gone into Shabbat, but it was full of hundreds of people earlier coming to dance, to sing, uh, and to mark that moment. This is a Shabbat table that's been laid for a number of weeks with chairs for each person who is missing being held hostage. Well, tonight, 
figuratively speaking, 13 of those chairs will now be filled because the hostages are home. We understand that they are on their way to medical facilities in Israel where they will be given close medical attention. Now, I should add that Israel, we understand, has not yet received the list of the hostages to be released tomorrow. That is quite late. By this time yesterday, they already had that list. But things have gone smoothly today, and that will build confidence between the two sides that things can progress over the coming days, because the hope is, is that 50 Israelis will be released over the next three days, that is in addition to those who are released today, and in exchange more Palestinian prisoners will be released. And there's a potential that the ceasefire could be extended if Hamas say they can release more uh, of the Israeli hostages. And just finally, if you can see it, uh, projected onto a building for the last seven weeks have been the images of those who are taken hostage with the hashtag bring them home. Well, tonight, on that building, are the images of the 13 who are home, with the line underneath it saying, we have come home. Uh, Alistair, I, I suppose the question then has to be what happens after the four days of this, this, this temporary truce, given the, the, the rate at which uh, today suggests uh, Hamas will be releasing those hostages. It seems certain that there will still be some in Hamas custody at the point at which this ceasefire ends. What's the best guess? Well, there is a hope that it can be negotiated that more hostages are released. And Israel have said for every 10 further hostages that are released, they would extend the ceasefire by 24 hours. Um, the Israelis believe that there are at least 90 women and children being held in captivity in Gaza. In this first stage, just to remind you, 50 will be released. So I think it is very possible that the truce, if it holds, could be extended for a few more days further. Israel will be very mindful, though, that Hamas will probably want to string this out. They'll probably want to use the time where there is no fighting in order to regroup, regather and rearm. And so that is why Israel has made it very clear that, in their opinion, when the ceasefire ends, whenever that might be, in four days' time, sooner, longer, the war will continue. They have unfinished business in Gaza and they intend to keep trying to find senior Hamas leadership, particularly in the south of Gaza. I think, having said that, the dynamic on the ground in southern Gaza will change. There's going to be a surge of aid, humanitarian aid, going into Gaza, including field hospitals set up by the Jordanians, by the Emiratis. It will make it much, much more complex for the Israelis to hit southern Gaza, which is what they really need to do if they're going to go after Hamas, if you have that surge of aid and foreign nationals, particularly foreign nationals amongst Arab states, which they now have diplomatic relations in, in southern Gaza. Alistair, thanks very much indeed. Well, the released hostages, many of whom are elderly, were accompanied from ambulances into a hospital at the crossing uh, to undergo medical checks. Uh, let's just tell you about a few of those released today. Well, this is Adina Moshe, who's uh, 72 years old. She was kidnapped and taken to Gaza on October the 7th from her home in Kibbutz near Oz after they murdered her husband. She's returning to her four children and grandchildren. Well, this is a picture of Daniel Ohlone and her daughter, Amelia. Amelia, just six years old, both of them kidnapped during a holiday visit to near Oz. And what of Ohad Monda? Well, he is uh, nine years old. He was kidnapped along with his mother, Karen, while they were visiting their grandparents for the holiday. Well, the released hostages were taken initially to Egypt before returning to Israel. Egypt playing a major part, in fact, in the negotiations for their release. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, is in Cairo for us this evening. You know, the people of Gaza just want peace, as we've been hearing from a number of the people that our camera crews inside Gaza have been speaking to today. They've, they've been asking for peace. They, they, they've been looking desperately, clinging to the hope that there'd be some sort of ceasefire soon. It came today in a lull. They had a little bit of, of, of respite. There's been obviously uh, some 
various breakdowns during the day, particularly uh, we heard from our camera crew making their way towards the north, trying to reach trapped family, trying to reach their homes, trying to see if they could recover any of their belongings, having more than half of them been displaced down to the south. And they were met by Israeli military checkpoints, Israeli snipers who, who fired into the crowd to, to force them back so that they couldn't make their way to the north. A number of them were killed. There were, uh, uh, well, we believe that maybe two were killed. Not sure how many more survived when they got to the hospital. Several were definitely injured, some with um, obviously, judging by the pictures, life-changing injuries with legs hanging off. And they go, they're being taken back into a health care system which is barely existing. It's pretty busted in the south. You know, overwhelmed with people, overwhelmed with displaced people and overwhelmed with casualties, wounded people, really terrible injuries caused from uh, houses collapsing on them, uh, limbs having to be amputated, no um, proper medicine to, to, to look after badly um, infected injuries. So the, the misery is still going on in, in quite large part for those in Gaza, even with a lull. They, they've, they're grasping onto this, this respite from the constant bombings. And we, we saw the skyline of Gaza was filled with bombs in the hour leading up to the start of this, this truce. So right up until the last minute, they were being reminded of, of um, and enduring in, um, this terrible bombardment. Well, this is the scene in Nantucket in the United States, where, as you might tell by, uh, by the flags alone there, uh, the President, Joe Biden, expecting, expected to make a statement shortly on events in and around Gaza. Of course, we were just mentioning there Egypt's role in brokering this deal. Of course, everyone also aware of Qatar's role at the United States, clearly playing its own part in bringing about this exchange. And around about, around about nine o'clock this evening, uh, our colleague Yalda Hakim will be bringing you a very special programme on the Israel-Hamas war and the very latest on the hostage release and prisoner swap. Stay with us for that. Now, police in Dublin are warning of further violence following a night of riots and looting sparked by stabbings in the city centre. 34 people have been arrested in connection with the disorder. The Irish Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, said rioters had brought shame on Dublin, Ireland, their families and themselves. Our Ireland correspondent Stephen Murphy reports. Sunrise in Dublin and the damage became clear. City workers started a massive clean-up operation in the small hours. This was unlike anything seen here before. Those involved brought shame on Dublin, brought shame on Ireland and brought shame on their families and themselves. They're filled with hate. They love violence, they love chaos, and they love causing pain to others. Three buses were burnt by the rioters. At least 13 shops were looted. 11 guard vehicles were destroyed. Dozens were arrested, numerous police officers were injured, one seriously, in a night of extreme disorder. The scale of the rioting and the destruction it caused is pretty much unprecedented here in Dublin. The police simply lost control of sections of the inner city for hours. So the question today has to be asked, was this a policing failure? There's no failure. This is, uh, regrettably, high protests have moved on and now we have to graduate and have a proportionate response to that. The rioting stemmed from a horrific daytime stabbing attack at a primary school in the city centre. Three children aged five and six and a teacher in her 30s were injured. A five-year-old girl is still critical. The suspect was subdued by passers-by and remains in hospital. Almost immediately, online speculation about his nationality was amplified by right-wing anti-immigration figures the fire had its spark. The influence of the far right in Ireland is on the rise, according to a research body. 
So really what we've seen, and especially over the past year, is a huge increase in mobilisation coming from far-right groups and their ability to kind of root their way into communities across the country and to get people onto the streets, mostly by spreading fear and hatred and often just blatant lies and misinformation. As the clean-up continues, the Irish government has pledged to modernise hate crime legislation within weeks. The police will review its public order tactics. This riot, a lesson in the weaponization of fear into incendiary anger. Stephen Murphy, Sky News, Dublin. Our correspondent Sadia Chowdhury joined us live from Dublin now. Good to see you, Sadia. Well, as it says on the screen, there have been warnings of more violence in Dublin tonight. Have you seen any? Well, we haven't seen any, but it is very... Uh, we're on the street where some of that violence took, uh, took place. Uh, behind me is the school where that first attack took place. And of course, there was then that uh, street violence that uh, ensued in the aftermath. And there is this real feeling that anything can happen at any time. And I think that is, you know, there's a sense that when a bunch of young lads walk past, people tend to get a bit nervous. But we have to remind ourselves, it is just a Friday night. Uh, people are out and about. Some people have been drinking. It is uh, perhaps typical behaviour. But I think in the context of what happened yesterday a lot of people see what happened yesterday as having come out of nowhere and so they don't know if tonight is safe there isn't the sort of bobby on the beat kind of police presence uh, that you might expect but certainly there are cars i can see uh, one now a guard a vehicle which has its blue lights on uh, and we've had them uh, pass through but the t shock has insisted that it is safe he's urged people to come into the city remember it is uh, black friday today so it should have been a lot busier than it is but many of the the shops are closed, some have boarded up their windows, whether that's from the damage or in, in anticipation perhaps uh, that there could be another night of unrest. But he has called on people to come into the city insisting it is safe, saying that the violence that took place last night took part in a very small part of Dublin and that it was controlled very quickly. Many people, of course, uh, disagree with him. But this isn't a typical Friday night. Uh, this, I'm told, is a night when uh, Irish families typically watch this uh, television programme at 9pm and they uh, turn on uh, Christmas lights together. It is meant to be a very festive time for the city and for the country, uh, but it has become a very sombre mood, uh, of course, all of this, while that five-year-old child remains in hospital in a critical condition tonight, a vigil taking place for her and um, other victims of la uh, yesterday's attack and a uh, support service has been set up. Uh, sorry, Sadie, for interrupting you there. We need to head straight to Nantucket where we can hear from Joe Biden, the US president. US diplomacy, including numerous calls I've made from the Oval Office to leaders across the region. Fighting in Gaza will halt for four days. This deal also is structured to allow a pause to continue for more than 50 hostages to be released. That's our goal. This morning, I've been engaged with my team as we began the first difficult days of implementing this deal. It's only a start, but so far it's gone well. Early this morning, 13 Israeli hostages were released, including an elderly woman, a grandmother, and mothers with their young children, some under the age of six years old. Separately, several Thai nationals and Filipino nationals were also kidnapped by Hamas on the 7th. They were released as well. All of these hostages have been through a terrible ordeal, and this is the beginning of a long journey of healing for them. The teddy bears waiting to greet those children at the hospital are a stark reminder of the trauma these children have been through and at such a very young age. Jill and I, and Jill's with me here, are keeping them all in our prayers today. Today, today has been a product of a lot of hard work and weeks of personal engagement. From the moment Hamas kidnapped these people, I, along with my team, have worked around the clock to secure their release. We saw the first results of this effort with the release of two American hostages in late October, followed by the release of two Israeli hostages. I've consistently pressed for a pause in the fighting for two reasons, to accelerate and expand humanitarian assistance going into Gaza, and two, to facilitate the release of hostages. And over the past several weeks, I've spoken repeatedly with the Emir of Qatar, the President of Sisi of Egypt and Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel to help secure this deal, to nail it down. And I want to thank all three leaders for their personal partnership to get this done. I spoke with the Emir and President El Sisi and the Prime Minister Netanyahu again on Wednesday to confirm the elements of the engagement. As I said, 
Today's release are the start of a process. We expect more hostages to be released tomorrow, and more the day after, and more the day after that. Over the next few days, we expect that dozens of hostages will be returned to their families. We also remember all those who are still being held and renew our commitment to work for their release as well. Two American women and one four-year-old child, Abigail, who remains among those missing. We also will not stop until we get these hostages brought home and an answer to their whereabouts. I remain in personal contact with the leaders of Qatar, Egypt, and Israel to make sure this stays on track and every aspect of the deal is implemented. You know, uh, this extended pause in the fighting brings a critical opportunity to deliver much-needed food, medicine, water, and fuel to the civilians in Gaza, and we are not wasting one single minute. Since my trip to Israel last month, I've been focused on accelerating the delivery of humanitarian assistance to Gaza in coordination with the United Nations and the Red Cross. I just spoke with my special envoy for the Middle East Humanitarian Issues, David Satterfield, for an update. And I've asked him to monitor our progress hour by hour and keep me personally informed. From the beginning, we put in place mechanisms to prevent Hamas from diverting these supplies. And we're continuing that effort to make sure aid gets to the people who need it. More than 200 trucks arrived at the crossing point in Egypt into Gaza today. These trucks carry food and medicine, as well as fuel, fuel and cooking gas. The fuel will be used not only to power the trucks delivering this life-saving supplies, but to, for desalinization, for water wells, for hospitals, and for bakeries. And hundreds more trucks are getting in position as well, ready to enter Gaza over the coming days to support the innocent Palestinians who are suffering greatly because of this war that Hamas has unleashed. Hamas doesn't give a damn about them. We also look to the future. As we look to the future, we have to end this cycle of violence in the Middle East. We need to renew our resolve to pursue this two-state solution where Israelis and Palestinians can one day live side by side in a two-state solution with equal measure of freedom and dignity. Two states for two peoples. And it's more important now than ever. Hamas unleashed this terrorist attack because they fear nothing more than Israelis and Palestinians living side by side in peace. You know, to continue down the path of terror and violence and killing and war is to give Hamas what they seek. And we can't do that. So today, let's continue to be thankful for all the families who are now and those who will soon be brought together again. And I want to once again thank the Emir of Qatar President Sisi of Egypt and Prime Minister Netanyahu for their partnership to make what we've done so far possible and for their continued leadership as we all keep working to implement this deal. And over the coming days, I'll remain engaged with leaders throughout the Middle East as we all work together to build a better future for the region, a future where this kind of violence is unthinkable, a future where all children in the region, every child, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Israeli, Palestinian, Arab, grow up knowing only peace. That's what we do. We're waiting now. We are just a matter of, I thought, maybe even as soon as by the time I got here. But in the next hour or so, we'll know what the second wave of releases are. And I'm hopeful that it's, it's as, well, as we anticipate. So thank you all for listening. I'll take a few questions. Mr. President, when will the first American hostages be released and some were included today? We don't know when that will occur, but we're going to be expected to occur. And uh, we don't know what the list of all the hostages are and when they'll be released, but we know the numbers where they're going to be released. So it's my hope and expectation will be soon. And of the 10 Americans that are unaccounted for, do you know all of their conditions? Are they all alive? We don't know all their conditions. Mr. President, how long do you expect this war is going to take? And have you encouraged Prime Minister Netanyahu to accept the timeline saved by the end of this year? I've encouraged the Prime Minister to uh, to focus on trying to reduce the number of casualties while he is attempting to eliminate Hamas, which is the legitimate objective he has. That's a difficult task, and uh, I don't know how long it will take. My expectation and hope is that as we move forward, the rest of the Arab world and the region is also 
putting pressure on all sides to slow this down, to bring this to an end as quickly as we can. Mr. President, what are the chances of this uh, truce to be extended by a few days or more? I think the chances are real. Mr. President, there are members of your party who would like to see conditions placed on aid to Israel. What is your view on that? They would like to see, uh, you know, a reduction in the bombing and that sort of thing. Well, I think that's a, 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 a worthwhile thought, but I don't think if I started off with that, we'd ever gotten to where we are today. Mr. We have President, to take this a piece at a time. Mr. President, do you trust Hamas to uphold their I don't trust Hamas to do anything right. I only trust Hamas to respond to pressure. Mr. President, you said you were hoping to get cooperation from Arab leaders. What are you hearing from them when you talk to them? What would you like to see them do? I'm hearing a lot, but I'm not going to speak to it right now. There's an overwhelming desire on the part of the region to — let me back up. I'm, I cannot prove what I'm about to say. But I believe one of the reasons why Hamas struck when they did was they knew that I was working very closely with the Saudis and others in the region to bring peace to the region by having recognition of Israel and Israel's right to exist. You may recall when we did the G20 about a little while ago, I was able to get a resolution, a, a, a statement passed through there saying we're going to build a railroad from Riyadh all the way through the Middle East into, into Saudi Arabia, Israel, et cetera, and all the way up to Europe. Not the, not the railroad, but it would be an underground pipeline and then railroad. The whole idea is there's overwhelming interest, and I think most Arab nations know it, in coordinating with one another to change the dynamic in their region for longer-term peace. And uh, that is uh, what I'm going to continue to work on. Thank you all very, very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Joe Biden there uh, saying it is. What's he just saying? Let's have a quick listen. Oh, no, just some, just some friendly, friendly words uh, for the White House press corps. Uh, only a start, but it's gone well. Today is the start of the process. Joe Biden saying that he expects dozens, uh, of, uh, dozens of hostages to be released over the next few days. Uh, let's bring in our US correspondent, uh, James Matthews, who is listening to that statement and, indeed, to the question and answer. Um, I, I suppose the one thing we can say, James, is that, is that Joe Biden is, is certainly framing himself and the United States as being very much an active part of this process. Not just that, making a clear a reference to what comes next, ending the cycle of violence, an explicit reference to the two-state solution. What did you make of it? Uh, I thought it was interesting, uh, Neil. There was quite a few lines to come out of that. Um, he was... Uh, he is very much front and centre of this. That's the way that he has styled himself in this process, in these negotiations, and that's echoed in the Middle East. Israel talks about this as being the Biden deal, not the Netanyahu deal. So I think, you know, we heard the positivity from Biden, didn't we, at the top. We should be thankful that there has been a reuniting between hostages and families. It's working, essentially, was the, the message. I've led this process, and, and he highlighted that it, ha it was starting to deliver. He spoke about renewing the commitment on hostages. He's spoken about US hostages as his highest priority in all of this. And he mentioned Abigail Adan, the girl who is four today. It's her birthday. We had been led to believe from senior administration officials, Neil, that she, uh, who was orphaned in the attack, both her parents killed, she would be among those released in the first tranche, in the first 50, along with two American women. There are 10 Americans unaccounted for. Uh, not, none of those three have been in the first 13, that first number released today. So there is clearly uncertainty at this stage as to where they are, what their condition is, and, um, you know, will they be released? It's the question he wasn't asked that perhaps he should have been. What knowledge do you have of them? Why were you so confident 48 hours ago that they would be released? What practical evidence do you have, A, that they're alive, and B, that they are on their way out. So uncertainty around that. And for the American audience, they want answers from their president on what he has called his highest priority, the American hostages, particularly for this four-year-old girl who has been emblematic of the American end of the hostage situation. So he said that we should soon learn the names of the second tranche of hostages. Um, perhaps they'll be among them. We'll have to wait 
and see for that. But in terms of other things he had to say, spoke about, as you said, renewing resolve for the two-state solution, talking about the future, uh, talking about hopes for a peaceful future. I thought it was interesting that he spoke about, well, he was asked about Netanyahu for, uh, for one thing, said that he would advise him to reduce the number of casualties while the elimination of Hamas continued. But then he said, he spoke about slowing this down uh, to, to bring this to an end as quickly as we can. He's looking towards an end game, Joe Biden. And I think it's significant about where we are and the results that he has achieved. Don't forget, nearly 50 days into this process, speaking about American hostages being the highest priority, we don't see any release of American hostages right now, uh, although we have a couple of weeks ago, but nothing in this as part of this deal. So it does beg the question, again, about Joe Biden's influence. He's talking about the long term, talking about slowing this down. Much speculation that the Americans would seek to use this ceasefire uh, to widen it, to use it as a platform to work towards a more extended ceasefire, a more extended peace process. But I suppose the question is, what influence does he have? What control has he got over the situation that is delivering results. Today, it's not delivered the freedom uh, of American hostages. And you can see why Hamas would be reluctant to do so. It does Biden a political favor if uh, Americans are released as a result of his efforts. It sticks pins in Biden for Iran-backed Hamas if they can extend it, if they can hold on to Americans. That increases their currency apart from anything else, it increases the heft that they have in their interactions with the, this American-led coalition uh, that has negotiated this deal. And my final point, Neil, of course, the worry for the American families of hostages is that this deal could collapse at any time, given unpredictable circumstances on the ground. So, you know, everything is up in the air, and uh, pressure on Biden, pressure remains very much on Biden. Um, he's speaking about how positive developments are so far today. Uh, he wants and he needs more. James, thanks very much indeed. Uh, do stick with us uh, here on Friday night on Sky News. Uh, after the break, we will have plenty from our news reviewers, Gronje Maguire and John Elledge, as we begin our review of the week, uh, including... Well, quite a lot, actually. We're going to be talking about the government numbers that just don't add up. Tax cuts that still lead to the biggest burden on the taxpayer since the war. Immigration figures that continue to rise and rise. All that and more after this.
welcome back to Friday night. It is, of course, time to introduce our panel for the evening. With us up until nine o'clock, uh, they are the comedian, Gronya McGuire, and the journalist, John Elledge. They're over that way. They're over that way. Uh, great to have both of you with us in the studio. Busy night and a busy, busy, busy day, of course. A, a lot of, a lot of uh, work around this evening. Um, but what should we start with? Uh, the Chancellor. He has been delivering his autumn statement. Uh, but, of course, well... Jeremy Hunt may well have sounded optimistic. Uh, people are still feeling poorer. Uh, cuts to national insurance, uh, big hikes in pensions and benefits, and a few changes to please big business. Uh, all of that welcomed by quite a few people, actually. Uh, but none of them changed the fact that we still face the biggest tax burden since the Second World War, and it is continuing to get bigger. But that is not the only uncomfortable number for Rishi Sunak and his government. Net legal migration, forget the small boats for a second, and well, that topped nearly three quarters of a million people last year, although it did drop back slightly in the six months to June. But it does seem every time the Prime Minister tries to reset his premiership, reality comes along to bite him in the bum. Is there any chance of seeing the polls close enough for the Prime Minister to take a punt or a, on a spring election? Or will he have to hang on and hope for a political miracle that might just see some of these numbers go in the right direction? Uh, Gronje, let's start with you, shall you? What did you make of that autumn statement? I mean, lots of detail, lots of numbers. We're all going yeah. to be richer as a result. No, we're not. OK, I think I'm speaking on behalf of stupid people, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm speaking on behalf of people. That. Not comedian and writer on the staff. <laughs> I, so when it comes to the budget mm -hmm. and when it comes to just numbers in general, it's a bit like terms and conditions on a new mobile phone contract. Like <laughs> I know I should be paying attention, but about like two minutes in, I'm gone. So basically my opinion is decided by the last headline that I read. So I found it quite confusing because it felt like there was tax cuts and then, oh no, actually we're paying more tax since World War II. So, um, yeah, I'm intrigued. It's a, it's a, it's a bit of a puzzler, John, because you know you had, you, you literally had the sight of the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt say, "Look at this, look at this massive, huge tax cuts," forgetting the fact that the guy who was sitting next to him, the Prime Minister, back when he was Chancellor, had pushed taxes through the roof. So the tax, the tax take is still only going in one direction. Oh. politicians misleading us to their own advantage. That's that's no. shocking. It's Heaven completely for unheard of. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, the reason we got this disparate set of headlines is that both things are true. This was quite a big tax cut. Mm -hmm. If you look at it through the particular lens of what, what rate national insurance was set at. Mm -hmm. If, however, you look at the taxes that people are actually going to be paying, because we're living in quite a, an era of high inflation and people's incomes are going up, albeit not as much as their cost of living, um, then more people are being dragged into a higher tax bracket. So you're not just seeing falls in the cost of living. People are also going to yeah. suddenly be paying 40% tax. I mean, that was that was the other thing. Uh, real terms household income it, in the, the office, sorry, the, the ONS statistics showing the most significant drop that we will have had in a handful of years since the end of the Second World war i mean for all the talk about things can only get better you know that might actually be true round about now because they all seem to be pretty rough and uh, what i find confusing is the tories their brand is kind of like you don't like us but we're good at business like you, okay we're not nice but like we can sort out money and if that is their only thing they have going for themselves and they're failing really badly at that mm -hmm. they might have to develop a personality i'm really worried about them i mean we used to talk about uh, japan's lost decade the figures from, from the, the, I think it was the OBR this week, which suggests that, you know, in 2028, wages, household incomes will still be on roughly the level they were in 2008. That's two lost decades back to back. And there's still no end in sight. Mm. And, of course, with, with David Cameron being brought back into the Cabinet, everything in this Conservative government's record from 2010 onwards is, is fair game come election time. I do wonder how much the party will be relying on its record when it comes to migration. I mean, the figures out this week are, are frankly, eye-watering. Uh, net migration up by 672,000 because, well, why? Explain this one to me, because I have to admit, I don't entirely get it. I, uh, thought, I thought we'd taken back control. I mean, so much of it, it's, it's work-based visas, I believe. Mm. It's um, since, since, uh, since Brexit, the social care sector and NHS have come increasingly to depend on, on workers from other parts of the world. I think particularly Nigeria, Zimbabwe and India were the three countries I saw mentioned as making up two-thirds mm -hmm. of these figures. It's people coming over here to do the jobs that a lot of people in this country 
are not able or willing to do. If we want lower net migration, then we need to be paying people more money to do those jobs. Mm. I mean, it's, it, it is difficult, isn't it? Because, I mean, if you read one prominent Daily Mail columnist suggesting that we, this is an absolute shame, that the Conservative Party needs to be talking about where the salary, the salary level should be set to be allow people into this country, you know, that perhaps British employers should be asking people to, to you know, are looking for British employees before hiring for overseas. The guy who wrote it, Boris Johnson, is the one who didn't do anything about either of those two things. The Tories are all over the place on this particular issue. Well, I know I personally was only asked on this evening because there was 10 British <laughs> uh, comedy commentators who were available. And on behalf of all uh, immigrants, can I just say our WhatsApp group has been buzzing all today. And I honestly think UK people should be taking this as a compliment, mm. that people still want to move here. Mm. You know, things have been a bit shaky for you guys for quite a while. And I think it should be a cause of celebration that... Uh, good old immigrants still want still want to contribute to your country. I think that's a really good point. People often, people have been complaining about immigration to this country for as long as anyone can remember. Try living in a country that nobody wants to live in and see how you like that. Um, just, 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 just one last, just one last point on all of this. What do we think is the potential then for for an election next May? I have to say that's where my money's on, and it's been there for quite a while. Oh, interesting. I mean, I feel minimal. I, I sort of feel they're going to hang on because <laughs> Labour has been 20 points ahead in the polls for over a year now. No Prime Minister in their right mind is going to call that election if they can delay it at all. And that takes us till the end of next year, if not the following January. Um, well, let's move on, shall we? Um, and Rishi Sunak, remember him, uh, well, his Eat Out to Help Out scheme has faced some scrutiny this week at the Coven Inquiry as tensions and disagreements between Boris Johnson's top scientific advisers and government were laid bare. We heard from Sir Chris Whitty, the Chief Medical Officer for England, Professor Jonathan Van Tam uh, as well. But Monday's evidence began with one Sir Patrick Vallance, the government's former, former uh, Chief Scientific Advisor, whose diary entries give us an impression of chaos in number 10. It was a bumper week at the Covid inquiry, but I want to start with, with Eat Out to Help Out. Boris Johnson maintained that he consulted with both his chief medical officer and his chief scientific advisor as to this. Both of them at the inquiry said, the week, uh, said this week, that's nonsense. I mean, there, there, there were clearly problems in communication between the politicians, the civil servants and the scientists. But the prime minister, the former prime minister, well, he's lying. And, and I think we should probably note that. It does feel a lot like somebody here, probably the former Prime Minister, is not telling the truth, doesn't it? Um, I mean, you say there are clearly problems in communication. It's the communication in question between the government and its scientific advisers or the government and the electorate. But there was, I think, I think it was Sir Patrick Vallance who went on the record this week and, and said that the current Prime Minister, it seems very unlikely that nobody had a conversation with him about whether Eat Out to Help Out was a good idea. Mm. That suggests that Boris Johnson is not the only recent occupant of Number 10 who might have been telling porky pies. Mm. I just, I'm so shocked. It's mad when people act exactly how you suspected they were acting and everybody <laughs> else said that they were acting. Like, I just, if you can't trust Boris Johnson to, to listen to advice, what is the world going to? It's just sort of mad. It's kind of like the inquiry is just like, you know what you thought was happening? Yeah, that's what was happening. Do we, do we think, however, that the, the, the inquiry so far, and this is something we explored in the Sky News Daily podcast this week, do we think that the inquiry is focusing perhaps just a bit too much? on the personality clashes rather than the big policy decisions. We're only on module two. This inquiry is going to run for years. I accept that the, the criticism may be a little bit premature, but are we perhaps getting a sign that this isn't the inquiry that everyone wanted? I think it probably is the inquiry that everybody wanted. I think <laughs> there is... There is a catharsis. Yeah, in people. There was so it. much anger after peace, Partygate. Peace and truth. Um, sort uh, of the commission. truth and reconciliation. That's yeah. the one. No, I think this is what people want to see. I especially think it's what people in our profession want to see. Mm. But I do take your point. I think there is a strong argument that lessons we need to learn as a country are not the ones about whether it's a good idea to have a party in the middle of a pandemic when you've told the public they can't do that, because that has a very obvious question, uh, answer, rather. The, 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 uh, the lessons we actually need to be learning are what we can do better next time in terms of uh, pandemic preparedness and making sure we have enough PPE and so on. And it'd be just nice if there was consequences. I know that sounds, yes. I sound like a crazy dreamer, but imagine the people who created the mess that we all experience actually experience a tiny bit mm. of consequences or actions. I'm like, you know, 
Well, I think the, the only thing we can say with certainty is you're going to be waiting some time, at the very least. Uh, Gronje, John, we will pause there just for a second. Uh, coming up next, of course, we will have much, much more from our panel. We'll see you in just a second. I think the most surprising thing is I looked at the numbers first and I thought, ah, OK, the number for the year ending June, it's higher than ever. Uh, mm. But then what was interesting is I looked further down and we see this very substantial revision of calendar year 2022, which suggests then that we're perhaps on a downwards trajectory. But there's a big caveat there. Remember that these are provisional figures and they could be revised. We wouldn't expect them to be revised quite so largely as they were in 2022, but that is still a possibility. So we've got people g coming to be doctors, nurses, but the really striking thing, care workers, so 100,000 visas going to care workers and senior care workers, and this results from a liberalisation of our immigration system last year that made it possible for what the mm -hmm. government had previously classed as lower skilled care workers to come in. I mean, we know this is an industry that's crying out for workers, but of course, critics have observed, you know, immigration can only ever be a short term solution to skill shortages in that sector. And it disincentivizes the government from investing more in that industry to improve paying conditions and attract more British workers. About roughly half and half between students and workers, the government has already acted to restrict the ability of master's students to bring mm -hmm partners and children in 2022 that was about 75,000 from January next year it will no longer be possible for one year master's students to bring their dependents that will have a role in bringing down the numbers but I think it's really important to go back to those changes the post-Brexit immigration system because while it was so much more restrictive for EU citizens now net migration more EU citizens leaving than coming in mm. it was actually more liberal for non-EU citizens, a lower salary threshold. People could come into work earning a lower salary. They could come into jobs that were lower skilled before Brexit had to be graduate level jobs requiring degrees. Now it's A-level or equivalent education. And then under Boris Johnson, the introduction of the graduate route, the visa that allows students to stay in on the UK, in the UK for two to three years after graduating. So these in combination are all adding up to these figures. And it will be really interesting to see whether the government is serious about introducing what would be a reversal of policy, mm. some restrictions on this. Welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Grania and John are still here. What are we talking about next? Uh, well, how about the electoral success of not one but two far-right politicians in rather different parts of the world? In the Netherlands, Geert Wilders triggered a meltdown amongst Liberals with a win for his Freedom Party. Wilders has for some time been viewed as a bit of a nightmare for the European Union uh, with both his anti-immigration stance uh, vowing the st to stem the tsunami of asylum seekers and much, much more. Uh, meanwhile, one of Buenos Aires, uh, in another demonstration of the art of the possible, Argentina elected Javier Millet, known in some circles as El Loco, which someone has handily put on the script there, means the madman. <laughs> uh, Millet does not believe in climate change or abortion rights and wants to replace the peso with the dollar to tackle Argentina's more than 140% rate of inflation. Donald Trump and Elon Musk were amongst those welcoming his victory. Um, guys, what, what is going on here? And I suppose you can, we mentioned him there, you can lump in Donald Trump in with this, this, this growth, this explosion in populism around the world. Although I've always struggled with the term populism. Doesn't it just mean, you know, they're saying things that people want to hear? I think it does mean saying the things that people want to hear, but also it's the things that people believe that might not be entirely true mm. sometimes. It's like... It's like the... E I think it's like the easy answer. It's like yes. the simple... It's like mm. a, a tweet rather than actually engaging mm. with the complex issue. It's just like, OK, what's the, what's the thing that will most push all your emotional buttons? Yeah, let's say that's true. Do you want to vote for me? Brilliant. It is very striking that both those new uh, leaders of government you just named mm -hmm. did come up sort of as media figures in the way Donald Trump and Boris Johnson did before. Fair point. Uh, Millay, I believe, has been like on a lot of TV programs dressed as a superhero 
talking about smashing up the economy. Uh, well, uh, well, well, Wilders has obviously been the sort of public figure over many years of his extreme right-wing views. Although um, he has, although, although to, 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 to be fair uh, to Mr Wilders, he has tempered the, uh, you know, overt racism, uh, now says that he is not. He, he's, he's going to govern for everyone, although they are in a bit of a protracted kind of negotiating Yeah, process he's not going to get a coalition otherwise. To become Prime Minister, yeah. he needs to work with, I think, at least two other parties. Mm -hmm. um, so, obviously, he kind of needs to sort of moderate his views a little bit. But I think there's some sort of thematic unity here between this story and the ones we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. Because two of the big factors that have contributed to the rise of kind of more extremist politics across the democratic world, I think, are, are two decades of, of economic trouble mm -hmm. uh, and the fact we are in, living in a period of quite high migration. So I think all these things are kind of connected. I, I, I do wonder as well, Gronje, whether they're here might be connected. <laughs> Just running through the list. That's very important. Javier Amelie has, has, has proudly Amazing. said that he hasn't brushed his own hair since he was in his early teens. Geert Wilders, I mean, it's long and it's luscious, but it's not my cup of tea. D D Donald Trump you throw into the mix. I mean, I mean yes. Boris Johnson, can we... He he's, like he's, he's a bit messy. Seven. I mean, maybe that's what we've been doing wrong. All these boring nerds reading books <laughs> and actually dealing with issue. We should have just been zhuzhing, giving our hair a bit of a zhuzh. Hey, some, some nerds have good hair, OK? <laughs> but but there, there, is, there, is a, there is a serious point to all of this. OK, let's, let's just deal with um, Millet to start with. I mean, he's, his, his, his public pronouncements have been fantastic. Just looking into him a little bit today, he called the Pope the Pope, a lefty SOB. Um, he's, <laughs> he's, of course, committed, given that, you know, Argentina's president, he is committed uh, to returning the, the, well, the Malvinas, as he calls them, the Falkland Islands, uh, to Argentine control. Uh, you know, it, it, he has to deal with the, eco the economy. I get that. I get that. But you don't remain in power as a populist for very long unless you do those things that you are standing on, scrapping huge swathes of the state. That's a big part of his platform. I do wonder how... I mean, I, th I think in some ways it's a category error to be trying to work out how much this platform is deliverable. But nonetheless, if the first thing he's going to do as president is abolish, I think it's 12 government departments, that's a lot of people he's immediately putting out of work. Mm. That does not necessarily translate to retaining a high sort of... Uh, a high level of personal popularity. Mm. Uh, another of his crazy ideas, which I saw he'd been talking about, was uh, legalising the sale of organs. Um, <laughs> which... That one passed me by. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, they call him El Loco for a reason. I... <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's an idea and one which we will gloss over and move on to another topic <laughs> just, just for a second. But, uh... Is that how he got this fabulous hair? <laughs> Harvested that's, that's hair. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, want, I want to change tack slightly and, and, and just briefly touch on what we've, we've been seeing in, in Dublin mm -hmm. over the past 24 hours. A very, very serious situation which began, we should not forget, with a number of people, including children, being stabbed in, yeah. in, in broad daylight. And then this is what followed. These scenes which have been condemned by, I, I would say, pretty much everyone in Irish society, mm -hmm. apart from those who actually attended. I mean, Gronje, you, you, of course, coming to you with the accent, I, 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 which, for which I apologise, <laughs> But, but what did you make of it's what you saw? It's just absolutely heartbreaking. It's mm. so... I'm so angry. I'm so disappointed. It's very sobering, I think. I always... Living in the UK, I've always kind of had this smug idea of, like, OK, you guys are going through a bit of a weird period, but Ireland, we're still in the EU, we're progressive, and then you see something like that, and it's the reality of this far-right extremism is everywhere. And just, just, just on that, I mean, because the, the word progressive that you used there, that, indeed, that was, the, that was a word that one of my producers used when we were discussing this, this story earlier on today. But, but I, I wonder if the situation in the Republic of Ireland is, is similar to that in Scotland. Sometimes we think of ourselves north of the border as a little bit more progressive than we actually are. Yeah. It's just, it's so depressing. They're absolute thugs. They've got, they do not, how dare they carry the tricolour? I mean, I'd say, have you read the Proclamation of Independence, which was written by socialists, but I doubt they can read. Mm -hmm. And I just think they're an absolutely international disgrace. And it is absolutely heartbreaking to see that, uh, that, that you know, scenes like that on television. It's just horrific. And, and we have some, seen some prominent figures on the further to, if not far right, who've recently returned to, you know, social media site platforms like X, leaping on this particular story without much in the way of fact and, and using it to their own benefit. 
I mean, the, the role of social media in all of this stuff can't be understated because it's provided a lot of these guys with, with a direct line to the voters they want to speak to without anything being fact-checked. You know, some, something can be shared a, a thousand times, a million times, uh, before anyone's seen the, the, the thing saying it's wrong. Mm. Uh, and that's very, very useful if you're a populist politician and not so much if you're a liberal progressive trying to actually govern a country. Although everyone's been having an awful lot of fun on Twitter this evening over Rishi Sunak and his inability to use a hammer, <laughs> which, of course, the, the story hasn't, hasn't entirely been told and all of that. Um, look, it, it, we just keep our fingers crossed that we don't see much more in the way of the violence that, that, that we saw last night uh, tonight. Um, guys, we are going to, to pause there and we will have you, of course, you back in the 8 o'clock hour for, for much, much more on the, the subjects of the day, including good week, bad week, and it's a cracker this week, I can tell you that. Uh, Gronja, John, we will see you just a little bit later on. Time for us to have a quick look at the weather, though. It's cold. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather. To fly. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. As mentioned, uh, cold for most of us this weekend with extensive overnight frosts. But western parts are looking milder come Sunday. Uh, before then, it will be largely dry and chilly this evening. At uh, the windy north and east coast of Britain, seeing just a few showers. North East Scotland, East Anglia, keeping the risk of those blustery showers overnight. Most other places looking dry, clear and calm, with an extensive sharp frost developing. But southwest Ireland, cloudier and milder. Into the weekend, Saturday morning, mostly dry, sunny and calm. But North Sea coastal areas will be windy with a few showers likely. And meanwhile, the southwest of Ireland will be rather cloudy with a little drizzle possible. Mild there, coast from cold for most others. The afternoon mainly fine too, but the cloud will take over more of Ireland with damp conditions in the west. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Coming up in the next hour of Friday night with me, Neil Patterson, an uneasy truce. But Israel and Hamas have managed a prisoner and hostage swap on the first day of a ceasefire in Gaza. We'll bring you the latest after this.
Welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Plenty still to come in the second hour of the show, including more from our news reviewers. And we'll be getting to the bottom of a bitter boardroom battle which could shape the future of AI. But first, the headlines this hour. A moment of hope tonight after seven weeks of war. 24 hostages are released by Hamas under the terms of a Qatari broker deal. They include 13 Israeli women and children, 10 Thai nationals and one Filipino. President Biden has welcomed the deal. Today's release are the start of a process. We expect more hostages to be released tomorrow, the more the day after and more the day after that. There's been celebrations in the West Bank after 39 Palestinian prisoners held in Israeli jails were released. Also tonight, a warning of more violence in Dublin after a night of riot and disorder sparked by stabbings in the city centre. And the former Paralympic champion Oscar Pistorius is to be freed from jail on parole nearly 11 years after murdering his girlfriend, Luther Steenkamp. Coming up, I will once again be joined by our news reviewers, the journalist John Elledge and the comedian Gronje Maguire, uh, with us until 9 o'clock, giving us their take on the big stories of the week. Thanks for joining us. It's Friday night. Evening all. In one of the most significant days of the war between Israel and Hamas, 24 hostages have been released under the terms of a truce deal. Tonight, while well, they're being reunited with their friends and family after undergoing medical assessment, they were freed on condition of a four-day ceasefire in Gaza, also the release of 39 Palestinian prisoners. There is much uncertainty now over what may be coming, but today does mark a moment of hope for families who have relatives and loved ones still being held by Hamas. Our Middle East correspondent Alistair Bunkle has our first report. <laughs> As the hostages left Khan Yunus in Gaza, in the care of the International Red Cross, they were cheered by Palestinians at the side of the road. Two peoples at war, but the relief of a ceasefire at last, evident on both sides. After 48 days in captivity, the hostages crossed from Gaza into Egypt and freedom. Among them, 13 Israelis, 10 Thai nationals and a Filipino. From there, as they changed buses, the world got the first glimpse of the small children with their mothers and the elderly women who were taken seven weeks ago and had not been heard from since. From the Rafa border, they were driven the short distance to Israel, through the fence, back onto home soil and into the hands of the Israeli military. Among the 13 Israelis released were nine-year-old Ohad Munda, his mother Karen and grandmother Ruth. Her husband is still thought to be in Gaza. Danielle Aloni and her six-year-old daughter were also amongst the freed. So too, mother Doran Asher with her two young daughters, Aviv and Raz. And 85-year-old Yafa Ada, who was paraded into Gaza on a golf buggy seven weeks ago. 77-year-old Hannah Katzir was proclaimed dead by Palestinian Islamic Jihad only a few days ago, but today she was released from Gaza alive. In central Tel Aviv, the Museum Plaza, which has now become a sombre vigil for the missing, was filled with the music of hope. After seven exhausting weeks of desperation, they danced as the news came through. This is a moment of hope and joy for Israelis, but hope in the context and knowledge that many still remain hostage inside Gaza. Not until all the hostages are released will Israel really celebrate. Until then, there are many families still waiting for their own Freedom Day. There are a lot of more than 200 uh, out there that we don't know whether they are alive or not. And uh, the, the continuing nerve-wracking situation is, of course, uh, keeping being continued. On board the Israeli military helicopters waiting to fly the hostages to hospital were children's ear defenders 
and mobile phones for the hostages to immediately call relatives. The Israeli authorities have been preparing for this moment for weeks. Many of the hostages will come out with no idea what has happened. Family homes have been destroyed and children will be told that they are now orphans. Life as they knew it will never be the same again. There's a protocol on how to approach them, how to speak with them, what information to give them, which questions to answer and which questions are better off to be unanswered at this stage by this soldier. Tonight, the hostages are being cared for in hospitals across Israel. They will stay there for as long as they need to. Tomorrow, it is expected that more will be released. Israel is finally starting to get its people home. Alistair Bunkle, Sky News, in Tel Aviv. Mm, uh, well, even after the ceasefire was supposed to have taken effect, Palestinians still came under fire in Gaza. Aid is badly needed inside the territory after weeks of bombardment by Israeli forces and truckloads of it began to arrive today. Our special correspondent Alex Crawford reports on the situation facing Palestinians as they get a few days' respite uh, from attack, a warning that her report does contain distressing images. As soon as the truce came into force, the trucks began rolling. This is what they've been crying out for inside Gaza. Critical aid, food, medicine and fuel finally being delivered during the agreed lull. And hundreds took to the road to try to reach stranded children, parents, friends, still trapped in the north. They hesitated at the Israeli checkpoint dividing south from north. So many have been displaced without taking anything with them. They're anxious to see if they have homes to return to. Then shots rang out. They waved white flags, but the firing went on. Witnesses told us Israeli snipers fired directly into the crowd, wounding several. The Israeli military said they'd warned the north was off limits. This was their response. More panic, more mayhem and more blood spilled. With one man appealing in Hebrew, Arabic and English for peace. Stop! Kill our children, our women, our, our youth. We are peace people. We hate the war. We want peace. We deserve to live like all the nations. The scramble to save lives and limbs in Gaza didn't stop, lull or not. Those who'd held on to life this long after nearly seven weeks of bombings must have thought they'd made it. But the fresh casualties on the day the truce kicked in now join the thousands of others struggling in a health system which has utterly collapsed. Our crew who managed to reach the now abandoned Indonesian hospital found a pitiful sight. Mattresses strewn all over the floor where dozens of wounded had taken refuge. Filthy, chaotic scenes through every corridor which speak to some of the torment these people went through before the hospital staff were forced to evacuate, taking whichever patients were strong enough to be moved. And they found multiple dead bodies. We counted at least 20 in this one spot. The centre of Gaza City has been obliterated. This was once the hub of the Gaza Strip, bustling and full of people now pitted with craters, and any building still standing is uninhabitable, and there are thousands of bodies still buried under rubble. But the break in the bombing is the first glimpse of hope in nearly seven weeks, and they are clinging on to that. Alex Crawford, Sky News. And Alex joins us live from Cairo. Good to see you this evening, Alex. And I think we both understand why in Israel there is an absolute focus on the released hostages today. Families have been crying out for the release since October the 7th, of course. But as they are coming out of Gaza, aid is going in and much needed aid at that. I mean, absolutely critical aid. Uh, they were meant to be taking about 200 aid trucks packed with food, medicine, 130,000 litres of fuel, including cooking fuel. We understand they've only managed to get over 137, so that is a lot fewer than they were hoping and anticipating. I thought it's interesting, though, that in the past hour or so, 
um, Hamas has put to, uh, together a compilation of uh, images showing them uh, handing over the hostages. And uh, you see a number of um, Hamas-clad uh, fighters. One appears to be a woman in which they uh, carry some of the elderly women hostages over and hand them over to the, to the Red Cross. Uh, in another scene, you see the Hamas fighter with her arm, I think it's a woman, with her arm around one of uh, the, the, the children hostages, the child hostages. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of chaos. I thought what was interesting about the whole moment of um, the hostages coming out of, of Gaza was the, re the reaction from the Palestinian people in, in Gaza because they were absolutely delighted as well uh, and really cheering as, as the row of Red Cross vehicles left the area. And I thought that, was, that is quite an interesting possible indication of future and, and whether, because obviously this has been absolutely miserable for everyone in Gaza, having to put up with nearly uh, seven weeks of bombing and there have been thousands of people killed, an estimated 14,000, another 7,000 under the rubble. Uh, the, the whole of the health system has absolutely collapsed. Um, they are facing dire um, conditions at the moment and no, with only 137 aid trucks getting in just in this first day, I'm not sure that's going to alleviate the situation all that much in the immediate uh, case. Alex, for now, many thanks indeed. Well, the released hostages, many of whom, as we've been hearing, are elderly, well, they were accompanied from ambulances into a hospital at the crossing to undergo medical checks. You can understand why. Uh, but let's just tell you about some of those released by Hamas today. And we start with Adina Mosh, who's 72 years old. She was kidnapped and taken to Gaza on October the 7th uh, from her home in Kibbutz near Oz after they murdered her husband. She is, however, returning to her four children and grandchildren. Striking photo this one. That's Daniel Aloni and her daughter, Amelia. Amelia, but six years old. Both of them kidnapped during a holiday visit to near Oz. And another one of the younger hostages taken, Ohad Monder. He's nine years old. He was kidnapped along with his mother whilst they were visiting grandparents for the holiday. Uh, but we'll stick with the story. And speaking earlier this evening, President Joe Biden said he expected more hostages to be released in the coming days. I want to thank all three leaders for their personal partnership to get this done. I spoke with the Emir and President El-Sisi and the Prime Minister Netanyahu again on Wednesday to confirm the elements of the engagement. As I said, today's release are the start of a process. We expect more hostages to be released tomorrow and more the day after, and more the day after that. Over the next few days, we expect that dozens of hostages will be returned to their families. Uh, well, during that briefing, the president also explained what he thought was Hamas motivation behind the 7th of October attacks. But I believe one of the reasons why Hamas struck when they did was they knew that I was working very closely with the Saudis and others in the region to bring peace to the region by having recognition of Israel and Israel's right to exist. The whole idea is there's overwhelming interest, and I think most Arab nations know it, in coordinating with one another to change the dynamic in their region for longer-term peace. And uh, that is uh, what I'm going to continue to work on. Now, well, let's speak to our US correspondent, James Matthews, who was monitoring that statement as delivered. Uh, evening, James. I mean, let's, let, let's talk about President Biden's role in all of this. Understandably, people have been focusing on the fact that this, this deal was brokered by the Qataris. There was some Egyptian input into it as well. But Joe Biden certainly would, would wish us all to frame it as seeing the United States heavily involved in this process as well. Yeah, and I think we got a very clear sense of that. Uh, Biden was front and centre of this. He brought it to a head in terms of the timing of it, spoke about our by our involvement. We were told that when he sat down with relatives of hostages, it was excruciating, gut-wrenching for him, and he gave them time uh, and space to air their feelings, very much invested his himself personally into this and invested his 
political heft such as it is. And I suppose throughout this process, uh, we are able to calibrate or recalibrate the influence that Biden has had in terms of shaping and steering this conflict the way he would want to see it going. Interestingly, he spoke about, he was alluding to the end game there, wasn't he? Talking about two-state solution, talking about longer-term prospects of peace, talking about how this truce could be extended and mentioning, talking about this wish to, to buy time to slow things down, perhaps an indication that he very much sees this ceasefire as temporary as it is, as a platform to steer things towards longer-term negotiation, longer-term talks about peace. But the, his difficulty is, uh, I suppose, right now, the lack of Americans in that first tranche of hostages. We were led to believe by senior officials that there would be at least three, two women, and one of the youngest hostages, four-year-old Abigail Edan. It's her fourth birthday today. They're not among that first number, although Biden said that we're awaiting a list of names uh, to be part of that second tranche. But let's, let me just show you something, Neil. Biden's in Nantucket. It is the Thanksgiving holiday. Let me just show you some uh, words and pictures from him leaving that venue. Have a watch of this. There you go. There were people cheering Joe Biden there, but there was a crowd chanting. You heard it. Ceasefire now. Free Palestine. At home and abroad, Biden faces intense criticism and there is intense frustration at him not calling for a ceasefire. He's always welded that to the release of hostages. Now, he's called the release of American hostages his highest priority. Six weeks in, we still right now uh, don't see any sign of Americans to, on today's list. There were two a few weeks ago. There was a sense of vindication in the White House that Biden had got things right, that the strategy was working when he struck this deal. Without Americans on the list today, the question can be asked, I suppose, what is that strategy worth today? What is Joe Biden's influence and ability to, to work his way through that diplomatic labyrinth that is this Middle East conflict that remains right now an open question. James, for now, many thanks indeed. And well, from those fresh pictures that we saw of Joe Biden in Nantucket in the last hour, we've actually received footage from Hamas uh, showing them transferring some of the hostages over to the Red Cross authorities as part of today's deal. Let's just take a look at these pictures here. A number of people, no audio on this uh, footage, we should say, but a number of people gathering round these vehicles, making sure that these elderly people, and you have to say, clearly having been affected by the seven weeks, that, by the several weeks that they have uh, been kept in Hamas custody, plenty of people cheering. Uh, one hopes that's because of the ceasefire and no other reason. Those, those pictures reaching us as sentient uh, from Hamas itself. Uh, well, at nine o'clock this evening, my colleague Yalda Hakim will be bringing you a special programme on the war, and we'll have the very latest on the hostage release and prisoner swap. Stay with us for that. Now, uh, police in Dublin are warning of further violence uh, after a night of riots and looting that was sparked by stabbings in the city centre. 34 people have so far been arrested in connection with the disorder. The Irish Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, said rioters had brought shame on Dublin, Ireland, their families, and indeed themselves. Our Ireland correspondent Stephen Murphy has the story. Sunrise in Dublin and the damage became clear. City workers started a massive clean-up operation in the small hours. This was unlike anything seen here before. Those involved brought shame on Dublin, brought shame on Ireland and brought shame on their families and themselves. They're filled with hate. They love violence, they love chaos and they love causing pain to others. Three buses were burnt by the rioters. At least 13 shops were looted. 11 Garda vehicles were destroyed. 
Dozens were arrested, numerous police officers were injured, one seriously, in a night of extreme disorder. The scale of the rioting and the destruction it caused is pretty much unprecedented here in Dublin. The police simply lost control of sections of the inner city for hours. So the question today has to be asked, was this a policing failure? There's no failure. This is, uh, regrettably, how protests have moved on and now we have to graduate and have a proportionate response to that. The rioting stemmed from a horrific daytime stabbing attack at a primary school in the city centre. Three children aged five and six and a teacher in her 30s were injured. A five-year-old girl is still critical. The suspect was subdued by passers-by and remains in hospital. Almost immediately, online speculation about his nationality was amplified by right-wing anti-immigration figures. The fire had its spark. The influence of the far right in Ireland is on the rise, according to a research body. So really what we've seen, and especially over the past year, is a huge increase in mobilisation coming from far right groups and their ability to kind of root their way into communities across the country and to get people onto the streets, mostly by spreading fear and hatred and often just blatant lies and misinformation. As the clean-up continues, the Irish government has pledged to modernise hate crime legislation within weeks. The police will review its public order tactics. This riot, a lesson in the weaponization of fear into incendiary anger. Stephen Murphy, Sky News, Dublin. Uh, let's be honest, you get nothing better to do, so stay right where you are. Uh, coming up, we will be continuing a review of the week's news uh, with the help of Gronje Maguire and John Elledge, including this. Uh, they will be helping me with Good Week, Bad Week, and it's definitely been a bad seven days for the SNP councillor caught cleaning her windows during a committee meeting. And we'll also be talking about Sam Altman, the darling of Rishi Sunak's AI Safety Summit, but now the subject of a Silicon Valley boardroom battle that threatens to destabilise the whole industry. Plus, in the sport with Teddy, the Premier League returns with a battle between City and Liverpool. Can Pep Guardiola's side stop Klopp from... Find out in a while. Going on. I'm Alex Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. This is what makes the job so fantastic.
Uh, welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. And it is that time uh, when we continue our review of the week's news and ask who has had a good week and who has had a bad one. The weekend is here. So who's relieved it's all over? And which of us have finished a winner? Not me. Our panel, however, uh, Gronya Maguire and John Elledge here. And which, which, where shall we start? This is, this, is, this, is a, this is a brilliant story, I have to say. We think that Stockton on Tees has had a good week. Now, you might want to bear with us uh, for the explanation. After a backlash over who said what in the House of Commons, uh, people have been rushing to support Stockton on Tees this week. Um, Gronya, let's, let's, let's start with you. I mean, this, of course, all because the, the Home Secretary, James Cleverly, did not call the place <laughs> an S hole or town or one of the two. Is, I mean, is that really what Stockton actually looks like? Because it's, it's looking fantastic. What do you make of this? I, on. I just thought it's so mad that James, that the standard now is so low of what, as Home Secretary, that he can do this in his first week in the job, apparently allegedly call an area of the UK and, uh, a, a bad place to live, and still be more professional than Swella Braverman. <laughs> so... <laughs> he did, however, Mr Cleverly did, however, clear it up. He was not referring to Stockton on Tees as an S-hole. He was referring to its MP <laughs> as being... S star star star, yeah. which I believe is uh, unparliamentary language. Absolutely, <laughs> but I mean, I thought it was interesting that uh, Ben Houchen, the Conservative mayor of the Tees Valley, mm -hmm. did actually put out a statement uh, criticising his own party's Home Secretary. He came out fighting for his for his region, um, but obviously, you know, the, the the red wall is looking a bit crumbly for the Conservatives these days. <laughs> uh, Teesside is one of the areas where they're still they're still quite strong. Mm. Um, so, like, I can understand why the party is loath to. to to just randomly insult it at this stage. Uh, well, look, if the, if the tourist board there doesn't come up with the slogan, Stockton on Tees, definitely not an <laughs> S-hole, according to the Home Secretary, then they're, 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 they're missing a trick. Um, but this is, this, is, this, is, this is another absolutely fascinating one, that really some, some, some the most dramatic pictures I think I've seen uh, all week. Uh, it was in Reading. We need to give the crane driver Glenn Edwards credit for this, the dramatic rescue of a man from a burning building. If you just look at the picture on your screen right there, that little cage, if you look very, very closely, you will see presumably someone in it absolutely bricking it as they're as they're pulled away. But John, Glenn Edwards, fair play to him. Absolutely, you know, cool as a cucumber throughout, just mm. like to say. I mean, I've been, I've, I've, my, I'm 20 years into my career. I don't think I've ever saved a life once. No, no, definitely <laughs> not. I've, I mean, I might have you know, assisted some towards an earlier grave, but no, I've definitely never rescued anyone. No, it's, I mean, like, it's, I, I think it's quite lucky that the, 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 the crane was there. You can't set a crane up in a hurry, can you? So. No, not at all. I'm just so happy. I'm just so happy for him that that was caught on camera, because if it hadn't and he had told his friends, <laughs> nobody would believe him. And he'd be like, I promise, I promise, there is smoke everywhere. Glenn's gone off on one again. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do, 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 whenever you see stories like this, though, I mean, and, and do you remember the, the, the Indian cable car out in oh, the wilds yeah. of India? I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, that was, that was, that was, th this was a, pr a pretty horrific situation. But, you know, if you're no fan of vertigo, do not go looking for the pictures. Because essentially, one of the cables on that thing snapped and they're all sitting there having a fag, chilling out, feet up against the sides. They're all very clearly trying to look like, like they're not all just panicking that they're going to die any <laughs> <Yeah>. second, <laughs> which is the natural human reaction in that situation. Mm. I think this is it should be the opening sequence for the next James Bond mm. film, or maybe just that for two and a half hours. I, I think opening sequence for a, for, for a show like this one. <laughs> Plonk me on top of a burning building, I can get into the crane, magnificently fly off. Does this but show yeah. have a bigger budget than I was told by the... Look around, <laughs> look around, clearly, clearly. We're just saying, yeah, it's all going in my salary, <laughs> obviously. But let's move on, shall we? Uh, Gronje, to you. Um, you have chosen... Everyone in the UK as as having a good week. Is this something to do with the budget? The, the uh, statement. I'm not. No. Even, I'm not even talking about Girls Aloud uh, reuniting. <laughs> that that joyous news. I'm talking about guy. What camera am I looking down? We did it. We did it. Lad babies. Reign of terror. Over Christmas number one is over. We got them. But why have they decided this year that they're not going to do it? Oh, I don't know. They got, I mean, I'm not, no, I they don't got the demands they wanted. The, Who knows? As, as I understand it, the sales of last year's Christmas single, even though they got number one, were quite a long way down on the couple of years before. 
Uh, so it's entirely... I don't want to be overly cynical about this, but it's possible that they kind of, like, saw their, their reign of terror coming to a natural end and decided to be magnanimous about it. Yeah, mm. Christmas is saved. We, we, we have been hearing from... Well, I don't know what their names are. Of course, I don't know what their names are, but we have been hearing from the bloke out of Lad Baby <laughs> explaining exactly why they won't be releasing a single. Let's have a listen. So... All of you have been asking. You've been asking for weeks and emails and DMs when you meet me in the post office. <laughs> Are we going for another Christmas number one this year? The answer is no! We are not. We've had the most amazing, incredible, loving, life-changing five years, and we want to say thank you. I mean, I'm only going to say that they have a fairly broad definition of all of you yeah, coming up to us and asking what's going on. And they've, like, they've raised an awful lot of money for charity. They've raised be money for charity. I, I think what this is really about is actually it's about the decline of the charts as an institution. Yeah. They used to really matter. Yeah. Uh, but now music sales and the charts more generally are a much smaller part of public life. If mm. they really cared about raising money for charity, they said, give us enough money and we will stop. <laughs> so I think they really missed an opportunity. <laughs> I would, have, I, would have, I would have contributed to that one, I have to say. Uh, now, what about bad weeks? It hasn't been such a good week uh, for Bristol Royal Infirmary. This is a cracker, by the way. Uh, now, their PR team unveiled at what's known as a multi-faith prayer area, only to have it pilloried on <laughs> social media. Can I wonder why? I mean... If you are going to be if you're going to be getting the prayer mat out, you wouldn't want to be doing it in what essentially looks like a, a shed for smokers. I mean, people did say it looked like a smoking area, it looks like a bus stop, and they're quite right. Uh, the, the airport does claim to have consulted with people. I can't work out who these people are meant to have been. Um, I don't imagine it's anyone that's ever used a multi-faith area. Mm. Uh, but it, it's also just, it's next yeah. to the roundabout in the silver zone of the car park, which I thought was a nice touch. <laughs> just, just to reiterate, as it says on screen and not the words out of my mouth, this is Bristol Airport who have, who have made, this, made this decision. How do you find yourselves, though, putting up a prefab shelter out in the car park and claiming that it is a multi-faith Prayer. I just love the hotspur. Hey. Good for them. Look, this is post-Brexit Britain. You know, we're all suffering from a, you know, a, a, a cost of, of living crisis. I, I think maybe it was 25 past five on a Friday. <laughs> the boss is leaning over going, have you sorted that, that multi-faith prayer yeah. area? <laughs> like, oh, sorry, just print a label out. We'll do it in the car park and wait. They were like, don't be... This is a, a prayer area. We want gold, we want marble. <laughs> this is really just, like, connecting with your higher power. Well, guess what? The internet got involved added to, to some... Pretty hilarious results. Let's uh, let's have a quick look oh, at, yeah. at this one here. Behold the glory of mankind's structures dedicated to the worship <laughs> of God. That's a cracker. Well done, Philip. What else have we got? Uh, <laughs> Bristol <laughs> Cathedral versus Bristol Airport multi-faith area. And let's have one more, shall we? <laughs> Much love to the neo-Calvinist vibe being given off by Bristol Airport at Prayer Shack. I suppose it's smoking shelter aesthetic does allow for the use of incense or sage. I love it. I do love it when the internet uh, gets involved. But I want to want to move on to to our next bad week. And, and John, this is from you, and it's. One IDS, Ian Duncan Smith. What? What's been happening to him? Uh, Ian Duncan Smith has been... Well, there's been a court case concerning Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, in in uh, October 2021, he was uh, set upon by some protesters in Manchester where they were holding the Tory conference. Someone put a traffic cone on his head. He was in a bit of a bad mood <laughs> after that. Imagine. Uh, and then some other protesters uh, called him Tory scum uh, and ended up in court. Uh, a judge ruled uh, some months ago that that uh, this was actually, you know, this is an exercise of free speech. It's totally fine to call Ian Duncan Smith uh, Tory scum. <laughs> Went to the Court of Appeal and they've said the same thing. So, so, so legally, 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 we are now entitled. We are we are more than entitled. I, I personally feel obligated <laughs> to, to point out that uh, a court of law has ruled that Ian Duncan Smith can be described as Tory scum. So a, a nice word to, uh, to say about Ian Duncan Smith. Growing well, up. I think he should. I, sh I think he should reclaim it. You know, Taylor Swift was called <laughs> Snake, and then she incorporated that in her public image. So I think he should bring out a load of merch. 
Tory scum and just really, you know, make some money off the back of us. I think you may have a point. Final bad week, and I have to get this in because we trailed it before. Uh, another person having a tricky week, an SNP councillor, Glynis Campbell Sinclair. Now, she was on... Uh, they were in a remote committee meeting on Monday. She, however, failed to turn her computer camera off uh, and she was seen holding a cloth in front of the camera. Oh, this is bad and carrying a basin of water to a nearby window during the closing 20 minutes of the th nearly three-hour session. The best bit of all of this, she maintained she had to do it because she never gets any time because she's got 12 horses. <laughs> I think that was burying the lead. Yeah. <laughs> I just think, you know what? Good for her. She's multitasking. Well, He's a, a man would never have been, Is that what you're saying? A man would never have been able to be, be on... Be on yeah, you'd be like, oh, and... we don't know how this works. Oh, well, Zoom. I, Here I... she is, looking after her, her dozen horses. <laughs> <laughs> I just felt... So, I felt so much sympathy for this woman, I have to say. <laughs> she was two hours, 37 minutes into this meeting. <laughs> uh, we've all been on those Zoom calls where, like, you're, you're suddenly aware that you haven't been paying attention for 20 minutes, you're yeah. staring at your phone, you're arguing on Twitter. I just think she's leaning in, she's doing something productive, she's the hero we need. Absolutely. Let's, let's be fair, we have all, and I'm not going to mention them right now, but we have all seen clips of people, you know, mucking up their Zoom calls in, in rather more embarrassing mm. ways than that one. So, do you know what? Fair play, Glynis. Guys, we are going to pause here, uh, because coming up after the break, uh, we will be discussing AI at Sam Altman, the darling of Rishi Sunak's AI Safety Summit is now also the subject of a Silicon Valley boardroom battle that threatens to destabilise the whole industry. That's next.
Uh, welcome back. Uh, this week saw a corporate drama with more twists than an entire season of succession. Uh, Sam Altman, the chief executive of a company called OpenAI, very much the darling of the tech world, in fact, well, he was ousted unexpectedly by the company's board. It sparked something of a Spartacus moment, with other members of staff threatening to quit and follow him to Microsoft. But then, just a few days later, Altman made a surprise return to OpenAI. Well, why do we care about this? Well, frankly, the stakes couldn't be higher. We're talking about extremely powerful technology that is changing at an incredibly fast rate, sparking safety fears, including the risk of wiping out humanity itself. Just, just, a, just a general concern that we've got there. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier, I spoke to our technology correspondent, Arti Nachipan, and started out by asking the very simple question, just who the heck is Sam Altman? So put very simply, he's the face of AI. So he is the chief executive of OpenAI, and that is the company behind ChatGPT. Uh. So they were kind of thrust into public consciousness after they made ChatGPT public, which was coming up to about a year ago now, in November last year. They had about 100 million users of it in just the first two months. And more or less, they're the reason why we're all talking about AI in the way that we are, because they've pushed what we call generative AI so far forward. This is the kind of AI that produces text or produces other outputs. So, so another tech wunderkind. So why on earth did they sack him? I mean, as you say, not just the, the, the face of the company, but the face of artificial intelligence in general. You'd have thought that was an asset they might want to hold on to. Exactly. And right up until the decision last Friday to sack him, he was still very public. He'd been at the government's AI safety summit. He'd been doing talks. And so it is still unclear exactly why that happened. Mm -hmm. There have been a few theories. Um, I mean, the the board that decided to sack him is largely changed. A lot of those people that made that decision are not there anymore. So there are stories about the tensions between Altman and the board. Not exactly clear why. There's also been a few reports about another model that was being developed by OpenAI, which has been given a casual name Q. Mm -hmm. And so there are some suggestions that this could have been part of it. But I think that some context that we do need to know as to why uh, OpenAI is a little bit different, is they were actually set up as a non-profit mm -hmm. in 2015. And so this means that unlike a lot of corporate boards, which would mainly aim to maximise value for shareholders, they were bound by different duties. They had to produce safe AI that was broadly in the public benefit. So if they sacked Sam Altman on the basis that they couldn't exercise some of those duties, it raises some questions about what could have gone on behind the scenes. But of course, the, the, the staff at OpenAI writing an open letter saying, bring them back or we walk and, and, and we see what has happened. Why do we care, Artie? Why on earth do we care about this AI stuff? Because, you know, on the one hand, I have played around with ChatGPT a few times, I find it vaguely impressive, but I'm, I'm kind of twixt two houses. On the one hand, you know, I, for one, welcome the arrival of our artificial intelligence overlords. On the other end of the spectrum, isn't it just a glorified search engine? So it depends on what, how broadly you look at AI. We've actually been living with AI for decades, mm. you know, Siri or whether it's a sat nav even, and this generative AI is the newest wave of it. But that's not the limit of its potential. It's growing exponentially what AI can do. And the reason we should care is how much it can affect our daily lives. So it can basically process a lot of information very quickly, which means we can do quite a lot more. I mean, companies can do quite a lot more. We can automate quite a lot more things. See, that's the key word, isn't it? Automation, the removal of humans from a variety of processes from which, well, they pay their mortgages and buy their kids' shoes. And that's the concern that a lot of people have with this phenomenon. Definitely, and understandably so. But I think that what we need to understand at this point is that we don't yet have a lot of jobs where you know you don't need any humans. It's more a case that the way you work might be different because of AI coming in to help with certain processes. But AI takes instructions. It doesn't think for itself. It's always programmed by people. So the, the stress that people might have about losing jobs, I think we just need to be careful about that and think about exactly in what way would that manifest and how. But of course, we had not that long ago the AI summit held at Bletchley Park, yeah, or home of uh, Alan Turing, of course, who came up with the Turing test, which was the test for, for artificial intelligence for, for a long, long time. I mean, the UK, when it comes to the AI sector, I mean, are we a player, really? It's a good question. A lot of the biggest companies are in the US or in China. The UK is a leader when it comes to academic research. Um, a lot of startups begin here, begin life here. Um, so I think it depends how you look at it. I think for the Rishi Sunak government, it definitely is a priority to look. 
so with apologies to Arty, we are just going to pull away from uh, that interview there uh, because those uh, released hostages, some of them at least, have arrived uh, at a hospital in Israel. Petah Tika, in fact, the, the Schneider Medical Centre. Uh, these are the live pictures, but I do think we actually have uh, some pre-recorded footage of one of the helicopters arriving. Uh, well, this is, this is uh, the footage that we have for the time being. Uh, we knew from uh, the Israeli authorities that there was to be this medical checkup. You can understand why uh, these people, some of them very old, some of them very, very young indeed, uh, have been in captivity since October the 7th. Uh, they will, again, according to the Israeli authorities, uh, will be heading to their families this evening. There is the helicopter uh, that I was mentioning uh, just a minute ago. But, of course, this is very much the early stages of this hostage-prisoner uh, exchange that will be taking place at least over the next three days, uh, the three remaining days, of course, of the ceasefire. The, uh, sorry, the, remain, the, the next three days of the ceasefire. We, we understand, of course, according to, to President Biden, who we were hearing from just a little bit earlier on today, his view is that there will be dozens, dozens released uh, over the course of this temporary truce that's been brokered, of course, by the Qataris. You can see them uh, just trying to move in some privacy screens there, but, of course, the, the camera in the position that it is in, I suspect uh, this might not be quite as private as some of those on the ground uh, would have liked. Uh, we know that there are more exchanges due to take place uh, over the coming days. President Biden suggesting that, for the time being at least, we know the numbers, but we do not know the names. Those names, uh, again, will be released at some point. Uh, Israel Defence Forces and, of course, the Israeli government uh, very, very keen at not to put that information out into the public domain before they know that those individuals are safe and are on their way back. Uh, we'll continue to, to monitor the situation at that hospital in Israel. Um, uh, you are watching Friday night on Sky News. Uh, just a quick thank you to our panellists this evening, uh, Gronya and John. Apologies, we didn't have too much to you, uh, but let's go to the sport. And it is the return of the Premier League, battle between City and Liverpool. I think the most surprising thing is I looked at the numbers first and I thought, ah, OK, the number for the year ending June, it's higher than ever. Uh, mm. But then what was interesting is I looked further down and we see this very substantial revision of calendar year 2022, which suggests then that we're perhaps on a downwards trajectory, but there's a big caveat there. Remember that these are provisional figures and they could be revised. We wouldn't expect them to be revised quite so largely as they were in 2022, but that is still a possibility. So we've got people g coming to be doctors, nurses, but the really striking thing, care workers, or so 100,000 visas, going to care workers and senior care workers. And this results from a liberalisation of our immigration system last year that made it possible for what the mm -hmm. government had previously classed as lower skilled care workers to come in. I mean, we know this is an industry that's crying out for workers. But of course, critics have observed, you know, immigration can only ever be a short term solution to skill shortages in that sector. And it disincentivizes the government from investing more in that industry to improve paying conditions and attract more British workers. About roughly half and half between students and workers, the government has already acted to restrict the ability of master's students to bring mm. partners and children. In 2022, that was about 75,000. From January next year, it will no longer be possible for one-year master's students to bring their dependents. That will have a role in bringing down the numbers. But I think it's really important to go back to those changes, the post-Brexit immigration system, because while it was so much more restrictive for EU citizens, now net migration, more EU citizens leaving than coming in, it was actually more liberal for non-EU citizens, a lower salary threshold. People could come into work earning a lower salary. They could come into jobs that were lower skilled before Brexit had to be graduate level jobs requiring degrees. Now it's A level or equivalent education. And then under Boris Johnson, the introduction of the graduate route, the visa that allows students to stay in on the UK, in the UK for two to three years after graduating. So these in combination are all adding up to these figures. And it will be really interesting to see 
whether the government is serious about introducing what would be a reversal of policy, mm. some restrictions on this. Welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Let's reflect on, on that which we've been hearing just in the past few minutes, of course, that, that some of those uh, released hostages, perhaps all of them, in fact, we need to get some more information from the IDF and indeed the Israeli government, uh, but perhaps some of those uh, released hostages arriving at a hospital in Israel, we knew uh, that they would be receiving some medical checkups. We, we understood, of course, as well, that they would be getting home to their families just as soon as possible. We are approaching uh, 11 o'clock at night in Petit Tikva, as you can see. So, so perhaps it may well just push uh, into the next day uh, for their families to see them. But I suspect, you know, as, as with practically every other Israeli, they will simply be hoping that they are home, they're smiling, and that they are in one piece. Let's bring in uh, Sky's uh, Dominic Wankon, who can uh, perhaps just give us a little bit more detail. Petitik, uh, as I understand it, Dominic, just about a, a few miles east of Tel Aviv. This was something that we were expecting. The hostages, as when they got <laughs> back into the country, uh, to, be, to be given some form of medical assessment. Yeah, this is always part of the plan, Neil, was, was that the hostages, as, when they came out, they would first of all be identified um, and uh, they would be checked against the list that Israel was expecting of uh, what uh, and who uh, would be released. And then next on the list was to be going to hospital for medical, uh, medical screening to be checked, I guess, for both sort of physio physiological but also for psychological um, issue, issues and, and conditions, and they will be um, then triaged, I guess, for wh whatever treatment they require, whether that is physical treatment or whether they will need uh, counselling, because, of course, they have been through the most extraordinary ordeal, all of them, and uh, there will be a process of debriefing and decompression uh, for them before they are able to then uh, join their families and try and then uh, join and rejoin normal life. So it's going to be a journey for them, of course, um, and that journey is only really just a beginning for them. And while that's been going on in Tel Aviv, I've come back from the West Bank, where we've, we've seen extraordinary scenes uh, there in Batunia uh, crossing, where uh, 39 Palestinian women and teenage boys uh, came across the crossing, um, there was a sort of prelude of tear gas being fired in ahead of them. They were delivered in this sort of fusillade of, of, of tear gas. Um, and then their coach uh, tried to get through the crowd of thousands of people. I haven't seen jubilation on the streets of uh, an Arab city or Arab town like that since the fall of Hosni Mubarak in Cairo. Extraordinary scenes of euphoria, people just ecstatic to see uh, them returning. And I think um, they have uh, been welcomed with extraordinary scenes of celebration, despite the fact that the Israelis have made it very clear to them and their families and to the Palestinian authorities uh, that any celebra celebration was banned, that they shouldn't talk to the cameras, they shouldn't talk to uh, the media. They've defied all that, a number of them giving interviews as they came off the coach. But I think what will concern the Israelis most, and also the Palestinian Authority, uh, is the sight of uh, green Hamas flags being waved in the crowd, but also on top of the bus. Some uh, One of the uh, Palestinian youths got on top of the bus and waved two green flags. And I think Hamas obviously will claim credit uh, for the release of these uh, prisoners, and this isn't. This is just the first night of, of many. So it's it's a, a coup for Hamas. It will make them stronger on the West Bank, no doubt, and that will be the cause of concern for Israelis. But it's the price they seem prepared to pay in return for getting their hostages, or some of them at least, back out of Gaza. As you say, Dom, we are expecting to see this these scenes repeated over the coming days. Do we yet have any information as to the numbers to be expected tomorrow, or indeed those who would be who will be released? I think it's pretty ad hoc. I mean, I think from what the Qatari said on the first day, they said we're, we're going to have 13 Israeli names and they are going to come out at four o'clock tomorrow. Uh, but that might, may not be the case for the next days. Uh, there may be fewer or, or more uh, hostages and they may not come out on, on the same time each day. And I think the same is the case for the Palestinian prisoners as well. We, we know 150 prisoners are expected to be brought out of uh, Israeli jails in exchange for the Israeli hostages, uh, but we don't know exactly how many are going to happen on each day. And I think the concern for the Israelis is that they're just going to have a repeat of the scenes they've seen on the West Bank today, which uh, don't help them and certainly don't help the Palestinian Authority, the more moderate faction that is trying to keep control of the West Bank. 
Tom, for now, thanks very much indeed. And as we just witnessed, the military helicopter taking off from the Schneider Medical Centre at Peretikva, uh, just east of Tel Aviv. Worth reflecting on that which we've been hearing this evening. 24 uh, hostages have been released by Hamas. Uh, almost half of those uh, Israeli women and children. The plan was always uh, that they would be brought to a medical centre for an assessment before being returned to their families. Well, these the pictures of that helicopter arriving at this uh, hospital in Israel. Huge amount of interest, of course, of domestically in Israel to see this process beginning, uh, that hostages are being returned by Hamas. In exchange, we should, of course, say, uh, for that temporary truce, that cessation of violence, and, of course, number of Palestinian prisoners um, being released from jail. Uh, more on that at nine o'clock with, of course, Yada Hakim. But a couple of the other stories uh, making headlines today. The car maker Nissan has announced plans to build new electric versions of its popular models at its Sunderland plant, as well as building a new battery factory. The commitment, well, it could help preserve the jobs of around 7,000 workers. And there is hope this evening that 41 workers who've been trapped in a tunnel for 13 days in North India could soon be freed. Authorities have said those trapped are safe and have access to oxygen, food, water and medicine as they await rescue. And the Chief Constable of West Midlands Police has said he completely disagrees with a decision by an inspectorate to move the force into an enhanced level of monitoring. His Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services had raised concerns about how the force manages investigations, how it safeguards vulnerable people and how it manages sex and child abuse offenders. More on all those stories on our website. Time for us to have a quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to sponsored by Qatar Airways. Afraid it's going to be pretty cold for most of us this weekend with extensive overnight frosts, but western parts do look milder on Sunday. Before then, largely dry and chilly this evening, but we will see a few showers. North East Scotland and East Anglia keeping those showers overnight. Most other places looking dry, clear and calm, with an extensive sharp frost developing, but southwest Ireland will be cloudier and milder. Saturday morning, mostly dry, sunny and calm. At southwest Ireland, rather cloudy, with a little drizzle possible. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. And that's your lot for this Friday night with me, Neil Patterson. But coming up next hour with Yalda Hakim, we return uh, to the situation in the Middle East and that uneasy truce. But Israel and Hamas have managed a prisoner hostage swap on the first day of the ceasefire. Yalda brings you a special programme coming next.